They were the the glamour of the NBA these last few years. Everybody's talking about the Utah Jazz. Dallas comes in there and dismantles them. Now they're talking about Donovan, uh, um, Donovan Mitchell. being gone, Donovan Mitchell being gone. Yep. Uh, Rudy Gobert. Now they just Quinn steps down. Dallas does this did all kind of stuff, man. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it's uh just to give context to this playoff run for Dallas, like they essentially, as you said, just completely detonated the Utah Jazz as we know them. Quinn Snyder steps down after eight seasons there, despite the fact that uh, Jazz CEO Danny Ainge was said Utah was, quote, desperately trying to retain him. So he was done. He was sick of the shit. Uh, Donovan Mitchell is incredibly conflicted about um, Snyder stepping down. He basically uh, is confused by the whole thing, doesn't know what it means for his future. Utah today says that they are not taking uh, conversations, not taking trade offers for Donovan Mitchell. However, they say they are fielding offers and are in talks for Rudy Gobert. So yeah. you take a guy that's like a three or four time defensive player of the year. One of probably the, it, I mean, obviously that alone should tell you he's arguably the best defender in the NBA. I know this year it was Marcus smart that won it. I don't know if Gobert is the absolute best defender in the NBA, but you can't count past two or three ahead of him, any position that said, the modern game is kind of evolving away from the more traditional lineup and his, shall we say, limited offensive game is a problem. Dallas floor spaced him and basically three balled him off the court mm-hmm. where he was unplayable at times. Mm-hmm. And to do that to a multi-time defensive player of the year in his absolute prime is unbelievable. So Utah, they're looking at a situation now where their longstanding, highly respected head coach is gone their star player is conflicted and doesn't know how he feels about anything in the situation. And they're Robin in that case and absolute stalwart who has been there longer than Donovan Mitchell is now apparently going to be dealt away. Like that's, that's pretty complete and utter decimation to leave in your wake as you walk out of that. So I don't know. Jazz wouldn't surprise me in the least if they do some kind of rebranding here in the next couple of years now. Obviously, the new ownership group and everything. I think Dwayne Wade's got a stake in that. Wouldn't surprise me if they do like a total rebuild slash rebrand. And uh, Dallas started that. Dallas set that about in motion. This was kind of the last hurrah for this core, for this unit as it was constructed. And Dallas just basically swept them uh not literally, but just swept them under the rug. Oh, we, just we, like, yeah, we, we swept them mentally. Yeah. We, yeah, like you said, physically. Jalen Brunson but, happened. Yeah, that, that Jalen Brunson uh, awakening, arrival, his time really opening the door to really letting us know who Jalen Brunson really is. He just went over there and just totally destroyed them and just put. Uh, he was Donovan the second Mitchell. best player in the series. You feel me? He and just, he was well, a guy he was that was. A Donovan Mitchell was crazy. Yeah. He, he's a guy that was supposed to be at best an X factor for Dallas. And he was the second best player in the series. And that's only because Luca returned to the series after three games, mm-hmm. like unbelievable. He had a 40 point game with zero turnovers and an obscene usage rate that even Luca would like scoff at. Right. Like, unbelievable. What Jalen Brunson did in that series completely thoroughly unequivocally outplayed Donovan Mitchell and Donovan Mitchell is the one called a superstar and making like $200 million in his contract. So yeah, that says that speaks volumes. And, uh, you know, and as a result of that, that kind of set in motion now, and I don't have this set up as a segment, but that kind of sets up in motion, the conversation on Jalen's contract. Now I've seen certain metrics and projections. Now um, it's a John Hollinger, kind of financial model that projects out a player's worth and what they're likely to get based on current market conditions as far as NBA free agency. Now he says it might be a little more generous than the deal he's likely to sign, but it was projecting him at like 28, 29 million a year. Wow. Yeah. Now to be fair, I I've seen him Hollinger say he imagines it'll be more like 24, 25. And I've seen some estimates and I had echoed this myself saying it might be more like 22, 23. But Jalen, he he's I can't believe I missed the quote when it happened in real time. But when the season ended, Jalen was saying, um, you know, playing next to Luka Doncic, like was it difficult to kind of like when Luka came back, sort of seed back 
that control. Like you had this super high usage rate, you were the focal point, and then you kind of had to go back to playing largely off the ball and uh, in a more supplemental role. And he's just like, he's like, I mean, it's Luca fucking Doncic. Like, what do you, what do you want? Like, yeah, he is one of the best generational talents of, of like this current era. And he's going to, he's going to do his thing. My job is to fit in alongside him to see what is needed from me, what the team needs from me, what Luca needs from me, and then play to my best ability in whatever is asked of me. And that could change game to game. That could change quarter to quarter. It just depends, but that's my job. And like, you're just like looking at that and you're like, that dude gets it. Like not many, not many guys have that kind of like, I guess, humble nature about them. Like there, there's too much ego. I feel like where everyone's like, yeah, that's cool. But like perfect example, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook teammates in Oklahoma city constantly warring with like, who was considered like the guy, like Russell was like, all right, fine. I don't, I won't, I'll concede he's the guy, but I want to be one a, I don't want to be considered Robin. I want to be one a, and like, that was problematic, but like Jalen doesn't show that tendency at all here. So I it would not, I'm, I'm not expecting him to take a, like a big hometown discount. I really am not. I think he absolutely deserves to get paid and he's going to, but I could see a situation where it's at least a slight, slight, you know, kind of like we saw with Tim Hardaway Jr. Just taking a little less to be here than an offer he could have fielded elsewhere. Well, I mean, sometimes it ain't all about the money, man. I mean, I've talked to athletes before saying, you know, they went after it. They wanted to get paid. Their careers are not going to last for so long. But uh, some guys said they regretted just going after the money and going into the wrong type of situation, and it didn't bode well for them. And that's what people got to look at, too. And I think that's what players got to look at. Yeah, it's all good. You're going to get that money. You're going to get that money in the NBA regardless because the way the spike is is going with the TV, revenue, yep. things of that nature. You're going to get paid. Like, regular players are starting out with 15 milli. You feel me? So you're going to get your money. Um, but uh, taking a little less, it'd be a – you know, I'm not in that situation, but I feel like you're in a good situation. Mm -hmm. You got a role kind of getting carved out for you. Um, you, 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 you know, just because you might get paid a little bit more somewhere else, you may not be doing what you're doing in Dallas. And that's what always have. I think players should be looking at that. What you're doing over here, you might not be doing over there, especially if you're not like the guy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, if you're not like the guy, your role could change big time. Right. You, you, the guy, you know what you are when you go to a different team. When you're not going to be the guy, you, you know, your role could be something totally different. And you go into a new, new coaching staff that may not believe, even though they signed you, may not believe in like the guy who coached you. Mm -hmm. And I think that has some precedence in it. So I would hope, you know, Jalen would look at that and say, Hey, I, I'm, I'm real comfortable here. I like my dog, Luca, and we got, we're building something great. Yeah. That's what you certainly hope. Uh, what's hilarious to me just before we transition off of this topic we were talking about the, the detonation of the jazz Phoenix might not be totally detonating, but that is such a circus at this point. It's actually kind of hilarious. Like not only, you know, they won, what was it like 64 games this year? Something like that. They were the best record in the NBA, 63, 64 games. And we're so arrogant going into the series, obviously even, um, Bridges was on a podcast. I think it might have been JJ Reddick's actually. Yeah, JJ, I've seen it. I've seen yeah. It. And and he was trying to explain kind of what happened in that Maverick series. And he was pretty candid about it. But like they essentially thought when they won game five, they thought it was done. They thought the series was mm -hmm. done, that they broke Dallas's will. Like, all right, Dallas got going a little bit, but you know, we put our foot back on their throat. It's done. And then they came to Dallas and kind of got hit by a freight train. And it got into their heads that just like, you know what, we might be the home team, but like it's game seven and anything can happen. And then when Dallas started pouring it on early, when that was, that was Dinwiddie's best game this postseason, Dinwiddie and Luca, just house of fire. And suddenly they're like, Oh, Oh, like they start feeling that momentum and suddenly it's a tidal wave washing the over them. Yeah. And they, they just now. completely collapsed so badly mm -hmm. You know, they're down 30 at the half, but they're down as much as like 46 in the game. Just mm -hmm. obscene blowout, historic blowout. No, never in a seven game series had the home team in game seven been blown out that badly. And now 
you know, what's, what's the, uh, the result of that <laughs> you get a press release like two days later from the sun's organization, basically saying like, well, obviously this isn't the, the ending we all hoped for, but that is the weakest thing I've ever seen. I would, I would cover my face if my team did that, I would, I would like, Oh my God, I can't, I can't look at you right now. It's going to be at least a couple of weeks before I can even like look at you without judging you after something like that. Cause that is the weakest thing I've ever heard. Then you hear like, okay, they're how long and how ardent were they in the fact that like, Oh no, we didn't make the wrong decision when we picked Deandre Ayton. Ayton's like never lost to Luca. Like he's, he's beaten him every year. Like he's been in the league. It doesn't matter. Like it's obviously we did the right thing. We ended up doing the Chris Paul trade and then Aiton was huge on our finals run where we went up 2-0. Obviously, this is the right call. Flash forward to the end of that series and now they're like, hmm, yeah, uh, he barely played in game seven, especially in that second half. And his coach basically said straight up, like, it's an internal issue, kind of implying that like he either didn't have the heart or he just like checked out. He just like folded, essentially. And now Phoenix is like, yeah, we're not going to, we're certainly not going to max you and we're not going to pay like near that because we're that disappointed. It's like, oh yeah. So what you're saying is you fucked up. <laughs> if you, again, if you had taken Luca, you'd have Luca Booker, you'd still have uh, Michael Bridges and you'd be in just a, a totally different, totally different situation with your franchise and what your future looks like. Instead, your window's not closed yet. To be clear, I, I, I still think Phoenix is going to be a, a quite good team, but now you're now you're desperate. Now you're like, oh, man, OK, he might not have he might not have finished the series strong, but he had some great games that game five when I, I thought that was going to be the turning point in the series. He kicked the crap out of Dallas. He had like 21 and 22, like just monster. It wasn't 21, 22. It was like 22 points and like 13 or 14 boards, but he just destroyed us. We had zero answer. And it was like, oh, you know, we kind of thought this was going to be the case the whole series, but this is really the first time he's gotten to us. And then he never really, he was quiet the rest of the way. His numbers were still good, but like it didn't matter because what Dallas was doing was mitigating that. So it's incredible to be in this situation where it's like you detonate one franchise total destruction and then the other one is like all right now we're going to move a major foundation uh foundational piece the guy that was supposed to be the number two kind of got relegated number three and now we're saying like and eh, we're just not going to pay you and making the front office trip all over itself giving out public uh statements and pu- press releases now you have them constantly crying oh chris paul had a had a quad injury and it was it was really problematic oh you know what? We had a COVID outbreak. Like every week it's something there's, it's literally like PTSD. They're still trying to explain maybe even to themselves what happened in game seven specifically. And it's amazing because they just can't cope. Like, it's amazing that like you inflicted this much trauma on a team that like in their minds, they were already flash forward to the finals hundred percent. They never had a doubt they were going to be back in the finals and you bounced their ass in the second round in humiliating fashion. That's just glorious. Definitely glorious. And <clears throat> one of the things, though, with Phoenix, I mean, they need to calm down over there for real. Uh, because like you said, I watched in the 90s with Barkley and Dan Marley and those guys. They ain't had nothing like that in all them years. So now all of a sudden, they, you know, you got a little bit of talent. But it was really Chris Paul helped you. But he's old. So if you lose a Chris Paul, you might take a step back. And now you're talking about moving DeAndre uh, Ayton. I mean, dude, he's a good player. Yeah, like, they're moving on but, from not moving him. Moving him would at least get something. I mean, but my thing is there was always talking about – there was always rumblings with him since he got with Phoenix. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've known that. There have always been some kind of rumblings with him, like he might not be the guy. And I think when they look, they look at his attitude – I don't know if it's the attitude that they think he had. I don't know if they think he has a killer instinct. I, I, I don't think, think he does. Yeah, I don't. You see, you can see him when he plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I've, I've watched tons of players. You, as you have too, DDP. You can see he got talent. He got world of talent. Mm-hmm. You can see he just don't have the killer instinct. He don't have that. Throw that ball into him. He's gonna take the game over and put the game, put the team on my shoulders, and I got this. He ain't that guy. 
So I think they're like, well, we don't really feel like he's that guy, so we can go ahead and just go ahead and move on from him. Pretty and, much. Um, I think any team he goes to, that's just who he is. Mm -hmm. So he just really needs to be surrounded by a bunch of alphas and just let him kind of play ball because he ain't that one. Yeah, the three teams he's linked to right now are Portland, Detroit, and San Antonio. Detroit's got I, Cade I like Cunningham. Detroit. Has Cade Cunningham, so maybe that could be I like that. something, but Detroit's been really bad for a while. And honestly, I, like, I, I think Cunningham has certainly potential, but I still hesitate to crown him just because he seems like he's had trouble staying healthy. And it's like, man, there was a lot of hype there. And I feel like health has kind of made it made it where I don't know if you like squint and look at it. Like, all right, is he going to reach that potential or is he going to be one of those guys that like can be sensational on a handful of nights a year. And then is just kind of steady outside of that. Basically is, is this guy like a true number one as he was the number one pick or is he just kind of like, yeah, he's, he's nice. He'd be a good like starter on like a, a quality team, but like he's not the dude. So that's, that's one that would be interesting. I, I, Portland, man. I, I think that whole thing's falling apart there. I, I think Dame is already peaked, obviously, and I think they're going to be on a gradual a good situation for him to go to Portland yeah. and just be shipped right back out of there. I, I agree. Uh, San Antonio has some interesting pieces. I think Pop is going into his last year. I think they've yeah. already said that. Like this next season is his last one. Yeah. Um, he might so, get some. He might get numbers over there, but he ain't gonna be nothing. Uh, yeah, he'll really be talking about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're and, gonna go be in the Spurs system, you're a cog in the wheel. Like you're not Tim Duncan. You're gonna be a cog in the wheel, and your team might be good, but you're not gonna look like a superstar. And I feel like he would care about that. Right. I, I like to see. I'm. I ain't gonna lie. I like to be. I. I. I am intrigued with the Denver. Uh, not Det uh, Denver, Detroit, Detroit situation. I like Cunningham. Um, I agree with you with the health. Uh, but I watched him as a player. I think he. Um, I think he definitely can be that guy. I saw leadership toward the end. I saw him wanting to take the ball and take the game over many a times. Mm -hmm. Uh, where he wanted wanted the ball. He wanted that action. He wanted to be the man. He and he was putting bringing it. And um, I, I think he can continue to grow into that. Um, like I said, in my opinion, um, what's the kid that went over there from Sacramento and uh, during the trade? Oh. Um... Um, uh, from Duke, what's his name? Yeah, 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 Bagley. Yeah, Bagley. Yeah, another guy uh, we, taken in front of Luca. Yeah, and and everybody, you know, everybody was talking about Bagley was going to be the guy mm -hmm. who came out of Duke, and he just floundered at uh, Sacramento. And I watched him go over to Detroit, and I saw him play better. And I believe uh, K Cunningham brought that out of him. So I think not like DeAndre will be uh, great, somebody great, but I think K could bring goodness out of him and i think it'd be a good fit for them because you know he's young and he's athletic and they need those type of big bodies to you know to kind of help the team 